all right. How are you doing? Children's Oh, okay. All right. I think our kiddos are going to stay in today, and, uh, and Mr. Ollie's out, but you still can get a riddle today. How about that? All right. Today's riddle is, what do you do if you come home and you find a lion in your bed? What do you do? Sleep on a couch. Sleep on a couch. That's probably a good idea. Any others? That's probably just as well. Uh, of course, the little thing I had says you, you get a hotel room. And, uh, yeah, you get a couch. You let him have the bed. That reminded me of uh, a time in our own life. Uh, I remember years ago we had a vet that uh, they attended our church, real nice family. And uh, my daughter was real young, and so she knew, he knew that she wanted a cat and uh, a kitten. And so he had a mother cat that had died and had a little kitten they were taking care of. And the mother had died for a while. They kind of nursed it. And so after Christmas or around Christmas, he called me and said, I have your cat. And I said, what cat? And I said, the cat that your daughter wants. So anyway, we went and got him. The name of the cat, we named him Peaches. And Peaches was a beautiful cat, but he'd been away from his mother too long. And so it didn't act like normal cats. In fact, a lot of times he'd come up and rub on your leg and you think, this cat really loves me. And then as soon as your back was, you turned your head around, he'd bite you. And, uh, but, but beautiful, beautiful cat. But I remember one day Morgan was playing with him and she had this, uh, the container had coins and she was just rolling and it kind of made a funny sound. And at first when the cat heard it, it kind of jumped back and or made a funny face. And so Morgan was real young. She thought, well, that's funny. So she did it again. And the cat did the same thing. And then she did it a third time. And this time the cat all of a sudden, the the back arched up. He started walking on his toes, and we thought we were all going to die. And so I remember I called the vet, and I said, what do I do? You know, this cat started this, and it won't calm down. And he said, well, the first thing you might do is get a towel and just go up to the the cat and wrap the towel around it and just kind of hold it till it calms down. And, he's, and I, I asked him, would that work? Will it really calm the cat down? He says it'll do one of two things. Either the cat will calm down or the cat will go completely crazy and just try to attack everything. My dad overheard the conversation, and I asked him. He was down visiting us, and I said, Dad, what do you think we had to do? And my dad said, I think we need to go eat at Pizza Hut. And so that's what we did. We went and left the cat all by himself for a few hours and came back, and, and he had recovered. So... Anyway, all right, we're working our way through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. So why don't you turn there to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. And uh, Matthew chapter 5. There we go. Got everything in my Bible marked, but Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're looking today in verses 27 through 30, and then 31 through 32. We're looking today at uh, saving marriages, and if we do that, it means saving our world. And we're continuing to walk, as I said, through the Sermon on the Mount. And today we're going to look at marriage, which in our society is in trouble, and uh, which means our world is in trouble. And as we begin, I want to share with you some simple truths from Jesus. I want to share a brief history lesson and then a plan to save marriage and to save our corner of the world. First, let's read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 30, and then 31 through 32. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, Jesus said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, a couple simple truths are found here in this passage as Jesus speaks. 
The first truth we find is that sex, physical relations between a man and woman, are met for marriage. And Jesus makes it clear uh, to keep it in marriage requires a commitment of your mind, of your heart, and your body. And uh, he reminds us here that there's also a grave danger when sex takes place outside of marriage. Now, the rabbis like to reduce the seventh commandment, and, and of course, this is part of the Ten Commandments Jesus is referring to. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, they like to reduce it to the physical act of adultery. But we all know the greatest sex organ that any person has is their brain, is our mind. I read that before anyone ever has cheated in bed, they have first cheated in their head. When someone cheats, they first cheat mentally, then they cheat emotionally, and then long before they ever cheat physically. So to stay pure, this means more than having not participated in the physical act. Adrian Rogers, a great preacher, said, if the law is on the outside, it's only worthless. But if the law is on the inside, then we experience the righteousness of God and that begins to be released in our life and the ability to obey it. So it has to take place in our heart. We have to decide in our mind, in our heart. Now, sex is dangerous outside of marriage. And uh, if you look at the rest of this passage, you might think that Jesus is being rather dramatic in verses 29 and 2 because he says, do whatever it takes not to participate, not to have this in your heart, in your mind. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. You might think that was so dramatic. And in fact, why is he talking about your eyes and your hands? The reason he talked in that way was because the rabbis would understand, because the rabbis always said that if you sin, what first happens is your eyes see something, whatever it is. You want it, you long for it, you conceive it, and then your hands take action. So if you're going to stop something, you've got to stop at your eyes, and then finally you've got to stop it at your hands. And... Uh, the Bible tells us that sex outside of marriage is very dangerous. You can all remember the story of David and Bathsheba. David stayed home from fighting with his soldiers, and he was up on his rooftop, and he happened to spy a woman. And uh, when he first spied her, that wasn't sin, but he not only decided to spy her, but linger on her and look and begin to think. And eventually he got a messenger and sent a message to her, and then he acted on what he had thought in his mind and his heart. And that's how it happens. You see, you dwell, you think, you act. And sex is a dangerous thing. Let me give you just a couple examples. One of the most awkward times ever had in junior high or high school is they would take a day, or not a day, but a few hours in a gym class instead of playing basketball or track or whatever else, they would have someone come in and talk about health. What they would often talk about was sexually transmitted diseases. And you'd sit there through a slideshow and everybody would get sick. And, uh, and they would tell you how dangerous it was. And then you'd go on about your day after that. Today, they don't talk much about it. But the truth of the matter is, they are more highly rampant than they've ever been before. We just don't talk about it, except you do see commercials on TV talking about some of the people who end up with them. But it is dangerous, but it's much more than that. It involves the destruction of the home when you have sex outside of marriage. I saw a silly poll the other day that said a third of people that are married think that it's okay for them and their mates to have an open marriage, to have physical relationships with anyone they happen to meet. Now, I can't imagine somebody actually saying that. In fact, I don't believe that poll. And you know why I don't believe that? Because I also watch the murder channel where they have all these mysteries and people die. And you know the number one reason that people get murdered? They cheated on their spouses. Somebody doesn't like that. And I don't believe that's true of anybody. But that's what our society is trying to say, that you can just do whatever you want. It's just recreation. But that's nonsense. But I, sex outside of marriage also many times results in bad marriages. Now, why do I say that? Because it is sex before marriage, and that's where God desired for it to be. Sex is a wonderful thing. 
It's a gift of God. It's for a couple. It's to unite them. It's to bring them together. It's for pleasure. But it's much more than that. It bonds them. And God created us for that bond. And we've, when we participate in that, we not only uh, experience a wonderful thing, but we also feel bonded to the person we had that relationship with. Now, if you've ever wondered, what is the number one reason for dating? Anybody know? What's the number one reason for dating? They, I don't know if they have dating today, but anybody know what the number one reason is? It is not to find a mate. I think God finds a mate for you. I had to about give up. I was praying all the time before God ever led me to Jackie and uh, allowed her in my life. But the number one reason for dating is not finding the one who's perfect for you. You know what it is? I think God does that for you. The number one reason is to find the people that you need to never, ever, 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 ever have in your life. A part of dating is breaking up. I remember there was a song when I was growing up, breaking up is hard to do. Well, if you're dating, you need to plan on breaking up a whole lot because you're going to run into people that don't need to be in your life. Either you're just not a good match or they lead you astray or there's problems you need to break. And have you ever met people that are getting married and they're coming together and everybody knows when they're getting married that they are what? They are the ones most likely to fall apart very quickly. Why? Because in many cases, in my own experience, I found people is that they began to date and suddenly they entered into sexual relationships and they felt bonded and committed to each other when they should have never been. And if it had never been a part of that, they would have never stayed together. They just feel that. They think they're in love, but they're not. They just have that bond that they never should have had. It keeps them together. And in this day where they marry, and many folks move in together. They move in and stay with people they've got no business being with. Why? Because they have entered into something that God meant to bond a husband and wife together and not strangers who don't really even know each other. Now, the second truth that Jesus shares here is that marriage is to be permanent. In Jesus' day, the rabbis focused more on divorce than about real marriage and its meaning. The rabbis were looking how to get out of marriage. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, it talks about divorce. And it talks about the reason to divorce is indecency. And uh, they came up with all kinds of reasons of ways that you could uh, uh, break up with a relationship. And, uh, and there were conservative and liberal views then. A liberal Hillel, a person said that you can divorce your wife for any reason. In fact, he had a long list of them. If you put too much salt in the supper, you could divorce your, your wife. If, you, uh, if they didn't speak nice to your in-laws, you could divorce your wife. But there was a conservative one named Shammai said it was only for adultery, only for breaking those bonds in marriage. And when they came to Jesus and they said, you don't understand what you're talking about. God meant from the beginning for a man and woman to be together. And he says, why is there a divorce? He said there's a divorce in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. Why? Because of the hardness of men's hearts. Why was there a divorce? Divorce was created because women were not being treated fairly and rightly. And a man would simply kick his wife out. And then she couldn't go on and have a life on her own because at any moment he treated her like property, he could just take her on back. And so she could never go on and establish a new life. A divorce decree allowed her to go on and to go and to start a new family, to begin a new life together. It was protection for the wife, the woman. It was to protect her. And God knew that some people had in the hardness of their heart were not treating women the way they should be. And so that's why God accommodated his will. Not because it was what he wanted, but because cruelty was happening. There had to be a way of protecting women. Now, Jesus said the focus is not getting out of marriage. The focus should be what marriage is all about. And in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus talks about what marriage is all about. He talks about that it's, it's the coming together of a man and woman from the beginning and creating one home. Now, a little history lesson, uh, how people have treated marriage. The Jews had the highest ideals for marriage, that it should be fidelity, should be kind, should be caring. They had ideals, but they fell so far short. 
In Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God says, I hate divorce. In fact, he hated what the Jews were doing in their marriage relationships. They had high ideals, but they didn't live up to it. Remember the Greeks? The Greeks were the great thinkers, and we base a lot of our society sometimes on how we do things. The Greeks, they were terrible when it came to marriage. They planned for cheating and unfaithfulness. Women were not treated rightly. It was terrible. When the Romans came along, they were all about family. And for 500 years, they never divorced until they conquered the Greeks. And when they conquered the Greeks, the Greeks conquered them because they started thinking like Greeks. And then marriage was just an inconvenience. It was just something. People got married to get divorced, to get married, to get divorced. It was just horrible. And the family broke down. In fact, the person who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire said the reason they fell was because the home broke apart. I read a little commentary about Barclay, Barclay's little commentary. He said, when Jesus said that he was not speaking, when he said all this, he was not speaking as some theoretical idealist. He was speaking as a practical reformer. He was seeking to deal with a situation in which the structure of the family life was collapsing and in which national morals were becoming ever more lax. And that's our society today. What the Greeks destroyed and the Romans destroyed the same thing will destroy us. But this morning, I have to tell you that there's a plan to save our world and to save marriage. And it starts all again with the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, Jesus said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And in this passage, he begins to lay down the foundation of how we can save the world in which we're in. As I mentioned, Adrian Rogers, I remember hearing him preach one time, and he said, we live in a cycle in this world. And that is that broken homes produce broken people that turn around and produce broken homes that produce more broken people. It doesn't need to be that way, and it shouldn't. And we have the responsibility to change that. And whether we're married or not, we have the responsibility to change that. And how do we do that? We teach our young people and we set an example in the world for what needs to happen in marriage. And the first thing we need to do is we need to teach young people what God's plan for marriage is. And where is that plan found? It's found in the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and following. It says, So the Lord God caused man to fall in a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and he closed up the place of flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Now, in this passage, we find all there needs to know about marriage in this one simple passage. It tells us to do three things, uh, to leave, to be united or to cleave, and to become one flesh. And in there, we find three things. First of all, we find the priority of marriage, the priority of marriage. You're to leave your mother and father. Now, a lot of times, we would think the priority of marriage is our children, Now, the children are important, and God will get you if you don't take care and love and look after your children. But the most important relationship in a marriage is not the relationship of parent to child. It is mate to mate. Because if that marriage relationship does not thrive, does not work, the children suffer. So your responsibility is to each other and to train those children how to have a relationship of their own. So first, we see the priority in the fact that we leave all behind. We leave mom and dad. I heard some crazy story about a man in trouble. His wife was really mad at him. Well, they hadn't gotten married yet. And that is she had went out and picked a wedding dress for her, and she was all excited. And he returned it. You know why? Because his mother wanted a different one for her to wear. I think he's in trouble. You need to leave mom and dad behind, and you need to be committed to your mate. The second thing he says is to unite or to cleave. The idea here is of permanence. There's not only a priority relationship in marriage, but there's a permanence to it. This cleave means to glue together. It means to weld together. In fact, many times uh, uh, we think that we unite ourselves one to another 
But in Mark chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said, What God has united, let no person separate. It is God that unites us together and it gives us that ability. There's a permanence to marriage. There should be and a stability. And then it talks about they have one flesh. They have a purpose. And that purpose is not just physical relationships, but it's a physical, emotional, and spiritual. They become one at the hip. They work together. They work together to raise a family, to, to serve the Lord, to stand together. They come together. And that's the purpose of marriage. And everything is expounded upon those, those basic understandings. Now, whenever God forbids us from doing something, it doesn't mean that God doesn't care about us. It means what? It means he doesn't want to hurt us. And whenever he commands us to do something, what he wants us to do, he wants happiness for us. And he knows if we don't participate in doing those things, we won't find happiness. The truth we all need to keep in our hearts is that God loves us. And in this Bible and in this passage, as Jesus is talking about in this commandment, he's not trying to keep anyone from sex, but as someone has said, he's trying to keep sex for you so it can be what God desires for it to be. In fact, sex is a wonderful gift. Over in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 4, the writer says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Mar sex belongs in the confines of marriage, and in it there is a blessing and a pleasure and has a purpose and a priority. So we need to show the people and share the people, young people in our lives that God has a plan for a home. It has a priority in that relationship. There's a permanence to it, and there's a purpose to come together and work together. We should also not only show them God's purpose for the home and plan for the home, but warn them. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 is a warning to not commit adultery. What does that word mean? It means to adulterate. It means to make something impure, something that was pure to make it impure. And when that happens, uh, that happens to us. The Bible talks very specifically about the problems of sex outside of marriage. It talks about that it is a sin, first of all, against oneself. There's consequences to it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits outside of his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. It is something that uh, is, you are damaged mentally, spiritually, and even emotionally. For years, when I was growing up, they talked to kids about having safe sex. That's not what God has in mind. You know what God has in mind? Sacred sex between a man and a woman who've committed their lives to each other. In that, he can work and do mighty and wonderful things. Sin is not only against yourself. Sin is against the home and the children of that home. I came across a quote by a fellow by the name of Kent Hughes. He said this, the man who commits adultery tells his child this, your mother is not worth much and your father is a liar and a cheat. Furthermore, honor is not nearly as important as pleasure. In fact, my child, my own satisfaction is more important than you are. Adultery affects not just individuals, the husband and the wife, it affects every member of the family, and especially the children. Children understand. I remember somebody joking about uh, these Hallmark movies at the end. The kids are always praying and hoping and asking Santa to bring mom and dad back together. That's all kids think about and feel in their hearts. When a family is broken up, it harms the children. It's also, believe it or not, a sin against the church. If you've ever read First and Second Corinthians, you'll find that's what it's all about. People were causing problems. Over in First Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 17, Paul says, If anyone destroys God's temple, which is us, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Whenever we have sins among us, it affects not only us, but everyone that we're united to. And in the fellowship, we are members one against each other. And the sin is not only against us, it is against the family of God. And it is against our nation. 
The sin brought down Rome and may be exactly what destroys us also. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 24, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, the, the writer says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. The enemy of the home is the enemy of our society. When homes are destroyed, then our nation is destroyed. And I heard someone say not long ago, people that treat sex lightly will also treat other people lightly. And that's the world in which we live, isn't it? We don't care about each other. We don't think about the feelings of what we do to each other. We don't value people. The bottom line, the sin is against the body, against your home, but even more than that, it is against God. When David was confronted by his sin, he writes about it in Psalms 51, verse 4. And when he comes to God asking for God for forgiveness, in verse 4, he tells God what? Against you and you only have I sinned. Proverbs 6, 32, it talks about we've broken God's holy law. We have broken his law. Now the law, if it does not have a penalty, it is only advice. And God's word is his law. And so there are consequences to our behavior. And the list of scriptures is long and diverse, which talks about the consequences of living a life in disobedience to God. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither, neither the sexually immoral, the adulterers, the adulterers, the male prostitutes, the homosexual offenders, and on and on and on. If you're going to live in defiance of God, then you will face a consequence from God. In fact, in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, it talks about the wrath of God is coming. Now, God is gracious. God is loving. He does not desire that for us. He wants to forgive us. But if we sin against God, we face consequences of those sins. Finally, we need to show people what it's like to live in a marriage that matters and makes a difference. And how can we do that? We can do that by deciding. Deciding what? Deciding to live for Christ. If there's sin in our life, the great and glorious thing is that we can always turn to God for forgiveness and His grace and His love. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18, where the Lord says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Decide to live for Christ, to live for Him. Seek his forgiveness and his grace and know his favor. But not only decide to live for him, depend on him. Trust in him. He cares for you. In the book of 1 Peter, it says, Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Whatever you face, you can come to him. You need to have devotion also. You need to pour out your love to Christ as you live your life. And uh, you need to care for your mate and share them grace and love. Some people say a phrase I've heard many times is I've simply fallen out of love. Well, in the Bible, it doesn't give us an example or an excuse for that. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul said that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And that's a command. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a feeling you have. It's something you need to choose to do, and you choose to love. In fact, the truth is, I read long ago, that your actions affect your feelings. If you act loving, you feel loving. If you act hateful, you feel hateful. Many times it's a choice. But more than that, you need to develop. You need to develop a love relationship with the person God's placed in your life. You need to continue to grow in love. Sometimes people think that love is like finding a rare diamond. You dig in the earth, you find this precious stone, you wash it off, you put it in a nice setting, or you put it on a table in a jar or something, and every day you go back and look at it, and there's my diamond, there's my love. Love is not like that at all. Love is not that way. It is not static, is it? It's like a garden. It's like something that you have to tend to and love and cultivate. 
Uh, just the other day, we got, uh, we got a plant to, and out the house, and I'm notorious for not watering the plants as they should be, but I'm determined to keep this one alive, and every day I water it. But you know, on the days that I don't water it, you know what? I know it. Why? Because it begins to wilt. In a relationship, if you don't cultivate that relationship, it will die. And how often do you have to do it? Every single day. When you wake up, it's a time to cultivate that love. In fact, the truth of the matter, that's what people talk about, that you ought to love your wife, you ought to love your husband more than the day you married them. Why? You had more time to cultivate and develop that love. Some people think, oh, it's all just feeling when you get married, when you're young. And you may have those great emotions, but you need to have a depth that's deeper than it has ever been. One of the dangers that people have is that they pay more attention or kinder to people in their life. They flirt with them. That's a dangerous thing to ever do. But there is a person you need to flirt with and care about and think about and plan how to look the best for and talk kindly to, and that's your mate. If you do that, God will honor that, and your relationship will be honored. Another D is you need to discipline yourself. You need to watch what you put your, where you put yourself and where your eyes go. You need to watch what you see and what you do. Years ago, I heard this passage of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27. The writer says very simply, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? If you put yourself in a dangerous situation, you're going to catch on fire. I heard someone one time said he had this plaque that sat on his little desk where he studied and uh, reminded him and his relationship to God. The plaque simply said this, He who does not want to fall down might not walk in slippery places. You need to be careful what you go and what you do. And finally, you need to have determination. You know when you need to make up your mind what you're going to do? Not when something faces you, but right here and now, before you ever face it. You need to fix in your heart that you will be true to God. You need to fix in your heart that you will be true to your wife. We talked last Sunday about making a covenant to God, and all of us need to make a covenant with God. Joshua said in chapter 24 and verse 15, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You need to commit to covenant that you will follow God and be pure in your relationship to him no matter what for the rest of your life. God's plans are very simple. God's plans, plan is for purity in marriage. God's plan for you also is if you fail to know that his plan is forgiveness. If we come to him, he is the God who forgives us once, twice, three times, four times, and more. He is a gracious God. And as we come to him, we can come to him with whatever's broken and trust that he can put it together and give us forgiveness and have a fresh start. John chapter 8 tells the story of Jesus encountering a woman caught in adultery. Where the man was, we don't know. It's one of the unfair things in their society. But in John chapter 8, Jesus begins to talk to them. And, of course, they want to stone her. They want to hurt her. And Jesus, wondering what Jesus would say, he writes in the sand and finally he looks up at them and he says, will you go ahead? But he who has not sinned casts the first stone. And then slowly you begin to hear the rocks drop and everybody walks away and there's only he and the lady. And he finally says to the lady, where are your accusers? And he says, there aren't any. And he says, neither do I accuse you. But he doesn't leave it there, does it? He tells the lady to go and to sin no more. We have a God of forgiveness and grace, and he forgives us no matter where we are. He simply asks us to go and to sin no more, to begin a new life that will honor him. We can bring him everything, and if we will trust him and follow him, he can put everything together. Our world desperately needs relationships that work. They need to be able to see them and homes at last. The Lord calls us to be obedient and to trust in him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you that you sacrificed everything for us so that we could know your forgiveness, but not only forgiveness, that we could know a life that's real. Lord, your son Jesus promised an abundant life if we would follow him.
And we know we can have that abundant life in our family and our relationships. And we just ask you, give us the strength to live that out so our families know what it's like to have permanence and purity and wholeness and joy. And let us live as an example to show others that this life is possible and they can have a home and they can have love that's lasting and satisfying. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. We have a brief time of invitation. We need to pray for our families. We need to pray for our mates that we'll be everything God wants them to be for us. Uh, I mean, we will be everything they need us to be for them. And we need to pray for our world. We have a bad, messed up world. But nobody is beyond the grace and the power of God. And with his grace and kindness, this world can be turned around. But it's got to see somebody live in the right way. And we need to choose to let those people live in the right way, be you and me. We're going to have a brief time of invitation. Our hymn of invitation is 417, Trust and Obey. And that's what we seek to do for the Lord. I'll be here at the front. If you need to make a decision for the Lord or need to pray for somebody, let us stand as we sing together. 417, Trust and Obey. Appreciate you leading today and helping us out. Linda will be back soon, and that'll be great. Invite you all to come back tonight. If you'd like to help set up, we'll be out here at 5 o'clock. And then otherwise, come and join us at 6. Eat some hot dogs and chili and, uh, and uh, enjoy some popcorns and watch the movie. And, uh, and invite your friends and neighbors. All right, our closing is hymn number 4, To God Be the Glory. Yeah.